Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am Gautam Mukundan, and uh, today, along with Mr. Femi Edgal from Nigeria and our expert uh, help from the Global Forum Service, and our rapporteur, Mr. Sharif. Uh, so, we'll be doing this session post lunch, and we hope to keep it entertaining to not put you all to sleep. And to that end, uh, let me first introduce our topic for the day. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. So in about 2009, we had the global uh, call for uh, the global call from leaders that said the era of banking secrecy is over. And that line for that time was a transformative statement. Since then, in about 2014, we brought out the automatic exchange of information, the common reporting standards. These changes have basically revolutionized the world with the amount of data we are collecting, the data that is being shared between jurisdictions, and the effort it takes. The Global Forum estimates that over 108 countries are exchanging data with over 123 billion euros being collected through voluntary disclosure programs and such uh, through automatic exchange of information. And 123 points of data being exchanged between jurisdictions under the common reporting standards. At Qatar, we have a very unique opportunity since we have a non-homogeneous set of jurisdictions, including those who were the early committers in 2017. Uh, 2017. And we still have jurisdictions amongst us who face problems or are considering implementation but have not yet committed to it. What we today wish to look at is, how do we help our member states with the problems they face? And the problems don't just lie with those who have not implemented, but also with those who have been implementing for a while. Data quality issues, issues with regard to cost, compliance, identification of reporting financial institutions are all issues all of us face. Uh, in today's session, uh, we were looking at covering broadly four broad areas, looking at what the domestic challenges were, what internationally is there that is to be done, and how can we help each other. The other areas where drivers of AEUI stand, which is what are the IT support, the challenges, infrastructure uh, beliefs, and finally looking at if all of us look at implementing AEUI, what do we aim to gain out of it, and how do we make the best use of the data? To that end, I am glad to have uh, all the participants out here with us, and I hope to call upon and learn from a number of our members here, and our expert out here, to get an idea. To start the discussion for the day, uh, we have about a 90-minute discussion today, so I first request uh, Mr. Irvis from the Global Forum to give us a broad overview of the state of play as on date. And then we can move to see where we are. So I hand it off to you. That is subject to the presentation being ready. Uh, oh, perfect. Hey, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. I'm very pleased to be here and to um, attend this session with you. It's an important one, as we know, the global move toward automatic exchange of information. So to set the scene, I will share a couple of slides with you. I'm not sure if they are already on the screen, no? A few minutes, okay. By the way, as we are waiting for the slide to be ready, um, how many Qatar mem members are not yet committed to automatic exchange of information on financial account? Do we have any in the room not committed yet? Uh, yes. That Tanzania. Tanzania. Gambia. Zambia. Okay, three in the room. Okay, which means that, um, yeah, it, it would probably be interesting for you to have a bit of context on automatic exchange of information. 
so that you can start uh, thinking of your own AEO journey. Fortunately, uh, nearly all of you are now members of the Global Forum, except Gambia, but I've started a conversation with Gambia, hoping that they will join us soon so that we can also start this. Thank you very much uh, for the slide. So this is about the effectiveness of automatic exchange of information, AEOI in combating tax evasion. I will quickly walk you through a couple of um, items. What is the common reporting standard AEOI? The four essential building blocks, the global status on implementation, the peer review mechanism, which is key in ensuring uh, a smooth and global implementation of the standard, and um, a bit of um, summary on the next step, which is uh, moving toward a new uh, standard on automatic, which is the crypto asset reporting framework. So what is uh, CRS AOI? CRS stands for Common Reporting Standard, and AEOI for Automatic Exchange of Information. Why we, are we using this acronym? It's because, of, of course, there are different types of automatic exchange of information for tax purposes. And the one we are talking about this afternoon is automatic exchange of financial account information, which is based on the CRS, the Common Reporting Standard. So this is a periodic uh, standardized and systematized exchange of financial account information between tax authorities. Um, the objective, of course, is to support the fight against tax evasion by ensuring that tax authorities can obtain in a timely manner um, information on their taxpayers, and more specifically, information on their financial assets that, is, uh, maintained, that are maintained abroad. This standard emerged in 2014, was adopted by the OECD, and subsequently uh, endorsed by the Global Fund, which is in charge of the um, implementation globally. So how does it work? You have financial institutions, these are banks, but not only certain insurance companies and, and other investment schemes are concerned. So financial institutions, they have to um, collect, to identify among their customers, their clients, those who are non-resident, uh, they collect the information, the required information on their customers, and they file those information with the tax authority, and then the tax authority in turn will exchange with their treaty partners. So we will see what are the, uh, the building blocks of this uh, standard. You first of all need to have an international legal framework because uh, exchange of information only happens between uh, treaty partners. You need an international agreement which provides for this form of exchange of information. You need a domestic legal framework. As you have seen in the previous slide, uh, financial institutions, they have obligations, so they are required to conduct certain uh, due diligence to identify their, their, their customer, their account, to collect certain information, and then to declare the information to the tax authority. So for those requirements, you need to have um, a domestic legal framework. You also need an IT and administrative capability because obviously this is uh, an automated process unlike exchange of information on request here, everything is through uh, the IT system. So you need to have the capability there to collect, to receive the information from the financial institutions, to transmit the information uh, to your treaty partner via what we call the common transmission system, which is the international gateway for sending and receiving the, the data but also your system should be ready to receive the information from your treaty partner to process the information and use them in a confidential manner. 
The fourth building blocks, and this was the transition, is confidentiality and data safeguard. This is critical to exchange information in general, but more um, for this automatic exchange of information. Why? Because this is um, information on the financial asset of taxpayers. No one will be happy to see his uh, um, bank account data you know, in a newspaper or elsewhere. So this information is only shared for the purposes of um, tackling tax evasion. And all tax authorities need to ensure that the information is kept confidential and protected. So the data uh, safeguard is very important. And in order to be um, kind of authorized to do AEOI, you first have to pass a preliminary confidentiality and data safeguard assessment by the global forum peers. Um, in terms of architecture, just to give you some, um, a, a very short overview of how it works, um, you have different players, and everything starts with the financial institutions. There are two categories, the non-reporting and the reporting. Non-reporting because they do not fall under the scope of the standard, and the reporting are those who have to uh, conduct the due diligence and report the information on financial accounts of their customers. So you have to define the category of reporting and non-reporting financial institutions. And those reporting financial institutions, they will review their, the financial accounts to uh, identify the accounts that are reportable under the common reporting standard, and therefore, they will um, put in place specific, very specified diligence to identify the reportable information. And that information would then be declared to the tax authorities. So as you can see, um, AOI on financial account relies a lot on the financial institutions. They have um, an essential role to play here. And this simply means that it's a process in which you cannot um, commit without involving your financial industry. They play a critical role in this. And the Global Forum's responsibility is to make sure that everyone um, observes the rules, and we do this through a monitoring and peer review mechanism in place, to, uh, which checks both the legal uh, and administrative framework and the effectiveness in practice to um, make sure that everyone is collecting and sharing the information in line with the requirements of the standard. In terms of global implementation, currently we have 125 jurisdictions committed with a precise date. In principle, all members of the Global Forum commit to implement the two standards that are promoted by the Global Forum, exchange of information on requests, and automatic exchange of information on financial accounts. But uh, given the complexity of AEOI, developing countries that do not host an international financial center were given the possibility of only confirming the date of their first exchanges at a later stage, when they will have, of course, put in place the needed capability. So um, for that, the first jurisdiction to start AOI in 2017, this is when we had the first automatic exchange of financial account information, where uh, developed countries and um, international financial centers. Um, so as you can see then, we are having more and more developing uh, countries committing up to now, um, more than half of the 127 and 25, sorry, are developing um, jurisdictions. What are the benefits? Um, I'm sure, I mean, I cannot preach to convert it. We are all tax officials. We, we see the, the very close relationship between these and, and the fight against uh, tax evasion. But just to share with you 
some figures currently um, uh, most of implementing jurisdiction before their first exchange because AUI has a lot of deterrence. Um, the deterrence effect is very important on taxpayers' behavior. So uh, before their first exchange, they will launch the voluntary disclosure program connected to AUI. So they, 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 they inform their taxpayers that by this date, we will be receiving information on your financial asset kept abroad. Uh, so if you come forward, and you know, regularize whatever uh, you may have missed in your past uh, tax um, returns. We offer you maybe to leave part of the, the sanctions or penalties or whatever. So these are voluntary disclosure programs. I think around um, 60 jurisdictions have launched these programs and you can see that um, more than 90 billion uh, of euros of additional uh, revenues have been collected through these voluntary disclosure programs, including 36 billion from developing countries, and with over 1.5 million taxpayers um, making use of the voluntary disclosure programs. Um, in 2022, these are the latest available uh, statistics on AEOI. In 2022, 108 jurisdictions um, exchanged automatically information on over 123 million financial accounts, covering total assets of almost 12 trillion euros. You can see this is, I mean, uh, very useful information for tax authorities, and you give them, uh, you know, the best use you can to um, track and trace your taxpayers' affairs uh, crossing the borders. And the good news is that um, some studies have shown that with the uh, implementation of automatic exchange of financial account information, we see a shift from financial asset from international financial center to non-financial center. There are studies um, saying that at minimum 22% of uh, financial assets which were previously maintained in offshore have been shifted by uh, taxpayers. This means a lot in terms of um, taxpayer behaviors and possibly um, uh, level of their level of their compliance. Um, the CRS implementation is also uh, paving the way to other forms of automatic finance or automatic exchange of information, such as country-by-country uh, -country reporting. Members who are already implementing the BEFS minimum standard uh, are probably aware of CBCR. Um, but very recently, and I will say a few words on this, we are having a new uh, standard emerging on automatic exchange of information on crypto assets. Uh, why is this important? Simply because the confidentiality requirements under the AOI CRS are exactly the same for other auto forms of automatic exchange of information. The peer review, this is the role of the Global Forum. This standard is built up on um, three main pillars, uh, what we call the core requirements. So we have core requirements, one on due diligence procedures, um, how financial institutions will have to uh, maintain, to collect, and to declare the information. A core requirement two on exchange of exchanging the information with all um, relevant appropriate partners and core requirement three on keeping the information protected and confidential. So um, this is just further um, providing details on, on those requirements. The global forum when you commit and start implementing will review your legal framework and also the effectiveness in practice. 
But even before you can have your first automatic exchanges, we review the confidentiality and data safeguard framework. Um, this is very important because if you fail that preliminary assessment, you won't be what we call reciprocal partner, meaning that you will be expected to send the information but not to receive because you, you've not offered sufficient guarantee of uh, confidentiality and, and protection of information. So um, we started this uh, peer review process in 2015, I mean the monitoring first, and then the review of the legal framework. And the first conclusion in terms of legal framework was drawn in 2019. And since there, any new member, any new commitment, committed jurisdiction will be reviewed on its legal framework. And in 2020, we started the effectiveness review. This is to ensure that the legal framework, the provisions of the legal framework are being implemented in line with the requirement of the three uh, um, uh, pillars of this standard. The first round of peer review on effectiveness was completed in 2022 with preliminary um, ratings assigned to jurisdictions on track partially compliant or non-compliant. But these were really um, uh, preliminary in the sense that um, since it was the first time, no one really knew uh, what a perfect system of AOI implementation would look like. So we wanted to have that first exercise to have a sense of how jurisdictions are implementing. And since 2023, we are conducting a second round with now on-site visits to meet with financial institutions, with tax authorities and any key players to see how they are going about implementing uh, the AOI rules. And it is expected to have a new report by 2025 on the outcomes of this um, second round of effectiveness review. Yeah, this is it's almost the, the same um, information I've just provided you. What are the outcomes so far? Um, based on the exercise in the peer review in 2023, on the legal framework side, you can see in green we have jurisdictions that are um, doing well. Their legal framework is... Um, it's it, it, in line with the standard. In, in yellow, you have those who are in place. So uh, the legal framework is in place, but not fully in place. It needs some improvement. And in red, um, you have not in place, or those who are, have just introduced their um, uh, amendment very recently and were not reviewed. As you can see, in general, most of implementing jurisdiction do have the legal framework in place. But where we see um, a lot of issues is on the implementation, effectiveness of implementation uh, side. Um, we currently have around 65 on track. On track doesn't mean the system is perfect, it simply means um, on paper it looks good but we need to confirm this during the on-site visit that are ongoing currently. And you can see that the number of uh, partially of non-compliant, it's, it's quite high um, because many jurisdictions are having issue enforcing the new legislation on automatic exchange of financial account information. And here you see some kind of takeaways. 20% um, of the assessed jurisdiction are still having difficulties to put in place the administrative compliance framework. This is on the effectiveness uh, in practice. Um, Anti-money laundering authorities or financial regulators are being given the responsibility to uh, supervise the AOI uh, rules, which normally is not 
um, has not been their duty so far. So again, this is new. It's something they will need to learn how to go about it. Compliance activities are being uh, taken, but not based on a strategy informed by risk assessment. So the level of risk uh, is not being taken into account by most of implementing jurisdictions. And then where most of the issues lie is with financial institutions in terms of verification, verifying that they are reporting as required, that the, the information reported is accurate and complete, up to date. So these are some of the issues we are seeing. Uh, I will finish by just um, highlighting uh, the changes that this standard is having. In 2023, uh, the OECD um, released the amended uh, common reporting standard. We call it CRS 2.0, which also uh, goes with a new requirement on the um, called CAF, another new acronym. CAF stands for Crypto Asset Reporting Framework. Um, these are recent development, and members of the Global Forum have again endorsed these amendments and are currently preparing the ground to start the implementation. Uh, to make it short, um, in by 2027, members are thinking of having the first um, automatic exchanges on CAF. Let me conclude by this. Um, as you can see, um, it, it's a long journey, automatic exchange of financial account information, but we at the Global Forum have developed a, a unique expertise. We have a full-fledged uh, capacity building unit within the Secretariat with several products to support our members. So for those who are yet to commit to AEOI, uh, be reassured that once you send your commitment letter to the Global Forum, we will be ready to support you to provide any kind of assistance that you will require. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Apology, I may need to leave because I'm also facilitating the other group on crypto assets. I will come back definitely. Come back. Thank you so much, Agus. That was very insightful to get an overview of AUI CR CRS. Before we dive into what we are aiming here today, so we now have a working group where we all, as participants, uh, will like to try to collaborate to get a better idea of how we can help each other with our implementation, those who have implemented and those who still haven't, to help out in this process. With that spirit, I now call upon uh, Mr. Femi uh, Edgal, uh, with extensive, over three decades of experience in the Nigerian tax administration, to share his insights on how Nigeria has navigated AUI CRS and to set a broad outline of where we think we can collaborate. With this, I hand over to you. Thank you and good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I'm Femi Edgar from the FRS Nigeria. And um, Gutam has put some clarity about what uh, we're doing here. Um, at Qatar, I set up a working group focused on automatic information. Why are we doing that? His chair, I've been asked to, to support him as vice chair. Um, the offering of automatic UI is very important to us. And taking a look at you know, why are we nudging our members at whatever state they are in the implementation of the AI system to step up? It is important that we consider what is in for us there. We are tax administrators. Our jobs, principally, 
primarily is to one, improve taxpayer compliance, but most importantly, deliver tax revenues to coffers. That's our job. And so whatever we can do domestically and by collaborating with other countries' jurisdiction, that will assist to bring in that tax revenue. It's very critical that we take the required steps to do it. And what Guterman has asked me and Nigeria and uh, later United Kingdom and uh, I think Singapore to share is our experience about how the use of automatic information has helped to improve taxpayer compliance, one, and to bring in additional tax revenues that was not there before you began to use uh, automatic information in our countries. And I will just start by leveraging on what um, Mr. Evis from the Global Forum shared about what this information is really about. Because it's called automatic exchange of financial account information. Because the tax man, we all are looking for information. That's the lifeblood of our work. So the taxpayer has concluded his affairs. Most of our countries, we do what we call a voluntary reporting and disclosure scheme. So you tell the taxpayer to come and file your return, whether it's an individual or a corporate person. That will, and often you tell them to even self-assess themselves. So you are relying on the um, honesty of a taxpayer. That's what most of our countries do. The very advanced ones could do pre-filling of tax returns. The beauty about Qatar is that we have members from the least developed tax authority to the very advanced. That's the beauty about Qatar. And so we can learn from each other on how we have used this tool or, you know, so that we can nudge others to get this information. So the taxpayer has given you a return, and so you have some information about the taxpayer. But every taxman knows that, yes, we trust the taxpayer, yes, we rely on a system of voluntary you know, disclosure and reporting, but the taxman can effectively tax and administer compliance if you have your own sources of information. Because if you rely only on what taxpayer provides, especially in many of our less developed jurisdictions, where the level of com compliance, bloody compliance, is low in every tax type, whether it's in corporate income tax, personal income tax, VAT, the level of compliance is low. So we cannot just rely on the information given to us by the taxpayer. What automatic information does for us is that it's, an, it's a source of information a source of information to provide a clearer picture of the tax affairs of the taxpayer aside from what the taxpayer has filed in the tax returns. And the information it provides is critical to the revenues and the quantum of it you will get in your country because AOI provides information that you might not have, very likely don't have, on your biggest taxpayers. In many countries, you know that the high net worth individuals and the large taxpayers account for between 70% to 80% of your revenues. Is that correct? That's the reality. Now, those taxpayers also have taxable income which is not sourced from domestic places. They have incomes in 
offshore locations. That's the reality about the tax affairs of high net worth individuals, the ones with the very deep pockets, and your large taxpayers. And so there's something about them that you are not seeing. And so they have filed those tax returns. How are we sure that what has been declared in that return, the taxable income, is the full picture? So the taxman must strive to get additional information to know the sources or to get information on, on the income of these taxpayers from all sources, either domestic or foreign. That is the information that the automatic information provides you. It gives you clarity, more information about your very big taxpayers. That's what we saw in Nigeria that enabled us to decide to join the global system of an automatic exchange of financial account information. We recognized one, that our taxpayers, the high net individuals, and the large corporate entities were filing returns, but we were not sure about the incomes of, they were filing in the returns. And so we decided that we needed to use this tool called automatic UI. I like, you know, highlighted by Evis. Maybe you make that determination, colleagues, then you must take the next step. We decided that we're going to sign the legal instruments. For you to get the information you need, that is not within your jurisdiction, that is in other countries, you to sign a treaty. And in this case, it was the Mutual Assistance in, in Tax Matters Convention, brokered by the OECD, that we signed in 2017 to say we are ready to join this party. We want this information because it will help us tax our big taxpayers better. Now, we also recognize that information is what we call in Nigeria solid information. Every major taxpayer that has kept funds out of your country didn't go and put it under the pillow in some apartment somewhere in Europe, West Indies, Americas. No. Every, your major taxpayers have put the monies in financial accounts, in some financial institution, somewhere in the world. And so that information is critical because the high net worth individuals and the corporate entities who are very likely to own properties across the world will earn from properties rental income. They will open an account and put the money there. They will earn, maybe they go and buy shares of a company, they will earn dividends. They will put the money in an account somewhere in the world. Likely, they might even earn business income. Maybe they have some businesses they've done out of your country, which you don't know about. They will put the money in a financial account. Now, you don't know that. They've only filed you the returns of the incomes they made in your country most of the time. A few times, you find that some of them are that transparent and they'll give you the correct information. But we know that most of the don't have a propensity to do that. So it's often that I won't tell you, taxman, you catch me if you can. Now, the automatic information tool helps us. Because my very good friend Joseph Swallow is here from United Kingdom, HL Massey. And so for me, all the Nigerians that have kept, who are residents of Nigeria for tax purposes, who have kept monies in their accounts in the United Kingdom, and any rent and dividends and royalty and business income, in all their accounts there. For years, I didn't know Nigeria, we didn't know. But when we joined and signed an agreement, and put in place the structures to receive and process it. 
suddenly we began to see what our Nigerian taxpayers, individuals, and corporates had in those accounts. That they were not put in the tax returns that were filed to us. That is a, that's a, a delight of a taxman. Suddenly you are seeing things, it's like they say in magic, abracadabra. <laughs> you know, you are now seeing things you never saw. That's the beauty of automatic UI. And so like we said, that since we began in 2017, by 2020, we had gone through the process that Elvis highlighted, those four pillars. So you want to join, you want to do automatic UI. First of all, you sign international legal agreement, first pillar. We did that in 2017. By 2018, the next step is put in place your domestic law. What enables you under your law to get those information and use it? We did that in 2018. Then the next pillar, which he showed us in his presentation, was that you set up administrative structures, set up a team. That's what we did in 2020. We, we set up an office and we resourced it with you know, uh, uh, officials, tax officials, who are the right skills and competencies to receive the information, analyze it. So by 2020, we had that. We also were ready for what Evis also shared about going through the confidentiality and data safeguards, peer review. Because the global body that coordinates the AUI system requires that every member who gets that information must demonstrate that they can keep it confidential and secret and guard it properly from the time you receive it end to end to the time you use it. And so the OEC, the Global Forum, will come and verify you have all those processes in place, all those facilities in place, both physical facilities and logical facilities. We demonstrated that by 2020. So in 2021, we began to receive the information after the OEC that visited and verified that Nigeria was ready to handle information. Because the information is very sensitive, definitely. Because if your treaty partner hands over to you the financial account balances of your taxpayers, your treaty partner has given you those information in trust, and there's an expectation between treaty partners that you will handle it and use it well and confidentially. And so we began to receive that information in 2021, just like we were also sending information in 2021. And what did we do next? So apart from the team that we are set up to receive information, it is done through a secure channel, which is uh, coordinated by, once again by the OECD. It's called the Central Transmission System. So it's a pipe that will send to us information. So the very first year, we saw that our taxpayers had balances across the world that was over $10 billion. And so we looked closely and saw names of persons there, individuals, corporates. And so, aha, action time. The tax plan is excited because you have actual information. I'm meant to share this with you so that those of you who are making this show, make it quickly. And so, what did we do next? We set up a special audit team. Remember, your auditors and taxmen that you must use for this must be given the right skills and tools so that when they get that information, they can match it with taxpayers' returns. And so, because at the FRS level, federal and service level, we handle corporate taxpayers. Our subnationals, who are the state level, who are called state internal revenue service, handles tax administration for persons who are individuals. And so we began to use the corporate information first to match it with the returns filed by the taxpayer. And so XYZ company has filed returns, and we can see the returns, oh, 
the income is $2 million equivalent, but we have AOI information, same company. We see a balance of $5 million, same year. What do you think, colleagues? It means that there has been no full disclosure. So it becomes the onus is now on the taxpayer to tell us as taxmen whether that money was a donation or was an income. Now, you can, your guess is good at mine. We were very successful in bringing in additional taxes by the fact that we, we confronted the taxpayers with this reality that though we told you to give us a voluntary reporting, what we see is that you did not <laughs> because we have other information that's showing that you have a high income that you have declared for tax purposes. And so the audit team will do a, a good job on that. And I'm sure taxes were paid. And the taxpayer often cannot dispute it. Because first of all, they are shocked. How did you find out? So for years, 10, 20 years, they've kept monies in those accounts. Which if you have reported to us, we never knew. And suddenly, we are confronted with it. So what happens? You know, initially you have a few of them that said, oh, we don't agree, we'll go to court. You are, you know, accusing us falsely. And so we say, okay, no problem, you want to go to court, let's be in court. But take note, you are likely to forfeit the money you have in those accounts to the government of that country and Nigeria. After a few days, they will come back and say, can we discuss? Let's, let's talk about this now. So they change their mind and, oh, this is not what we're going to call about. Now, that's the power of the AOI tool. That's what it does. And so, in the beginning, we began to get additional taxes. And we've not used most of the information. We started because the bulk of information was much. So we had thresholds. The only things we are told, let's work with those with $5 million balances and above first. Before we go to the others. But you see, there's this thing about the automatic UI balance information. If a taxpayer, for example, has balances, because what the information shows you is that you have balances at the end of the year. So this balance, you know, a million dollars, for example, at the end of 31st of December 2023. That's what you see when you get a report. Now, we've got two reports for this year now showing balances that was for 31st December 2023. Because the exchange happens between over 100 countries in September every year. So this year, we've gotten balances from, about, from account of our taxpayers abroad. Now, but that is a balance of 1 million. What is now, what has happened in the, in the year, you do not know. So you can also use the extra information on request to tell that country, provide me the bank statements. So I'm seeing a balance of 1 million, but... What has transpired during the year, during the year, I can see it in a bank statement, which has shown that, oh, $50 million has gone in and out. So you can use the AUI tool coupled with the UI request tool to get more information. And so we began to get, one, additional tax revenues, two, the compliance behavior of the taxpayer has changed because they now know, oh, so you know, and the news goes round. You know, uh, said there's a fraternity of, of uh, crooks that have been lying to the taxman. So they call and say, they now know you better go and disclose because we bring penalty and interest on it. So compliance behavior changed also. Now, that is our journey. I believe that in summary, chair and colleagues, we, what we try to do is to provide you a compelling case to use the AOI tool and to say very clearly that whatever state you are as a member of Qatar, whether you are, you are thinking about it, you want to put in place a policy and now you know, begin to do the, 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 the law and now join the, the, the global phone system or you're using it. It is beneficial. And in our journey, we must acknowledge the fact that we have in this room in Qatar, those who have gone ahead of us and can help us navigate it. 
And that's why in Nigeria, we must we continue to applaud the United Kingdom HMRC for holding our hands, working with the OECD Global Forum that led us to this point where we can say the automatic information tool has been useful. And our journey ahead is that, you know, you know we've done a lot using it for corporate to tax the corporate taxpayers. We want to go ahead working with our subnationals, the state internal revenue boards, to provide them that information on the very high net worth individuals in their states who have something, would I say to hide? <laughs> who have put something away that will be of interest to the taxman. On that note, Putam, I'd like to um, appreciate us and to say that Qatar is willing to support you in this journey. And those of us who have experience, I'm sure they're also willing to support you. So that together, we can see more members of Qatar use this very important tool to achieve our goals as tax administrators, which is one, to bring in additional tax revenues, two, to improve tax compliance behavior. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you for that emphatic uh, endorsement of what AEUI and CRS is and how you put eloquently how the process we have started, what you started in 2017 and ended with a special team now analyzing data. In the spirit of what you said of learning from each other, we now have, uh, we now, I would, would like to hear from a jurisdiction that was among the early adopters. In 2017, the United Kingdom was one of the first adopters of AUI as the 49 countries that signed on to it. So in that spirit, uh, I'd request Mr. John uh, from the UK, from the HMRC, to just give us a brief overview of what the challenges they face even today, despite being an early adopter, and what they gain from it. With this, I hand over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I feel like Avis was up here telling you what the standard is and it's, it's achievable. And Femi gave you an absolutely fantastic, inspiring talk about why you should do it. And now, uh, Chair, you've asked me to come up and say, oh, now tell us how miserable it can be. <laughs> so before I do that, and I will, I will give you a couple of examples of the problems that you might come across. And they'll be fairly, most of them will be fairly typical, and maybe one or two will be particular to the UK. Um, but before I do that, I did want to start by absolutely endorsing what both, both Evis and Femi have said. Um, the Global Forum has first-class technical assistance, for sure. If you decide you want to go down this route, you will get help from them. And you won't just be getting help from the Global Forum if you want it. Um, you heard Femi say that the UK worked with Nigeria as well. And we're willing to do that so long as it's properly coordinated and all the people involved know what's going on. Then um, certainly the UK has worked with some of the other CATA jurisdictions as well. I can't promise to say yes in every case, but there is help available if this is something that you want to do. Okay, so that's all the positive bits out the way. Um, what about some of the slightly more negative <laughs> aspects? What are some of the, the, the potholes to avoid I'm going to talk about technological ones. I'm going to talk about compliance ones in the sense of making sure that your reporting institutions are doing what they should be doing when they report to you. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about the use of data. And that's, that's uh, compliance in the other sense, where you're using the data to carry out your taxpayer compliance and bring in some more money. So on the technological front, you heard Dan when he was speaking earlier on this morning with regards to global minimum tax, tell you that um, in the UK, our typical approach when we're introducing something is to form a group of the stakeholders involved, which includes the industry people affected by it, and to work with them to come up with guidance so they understand what the law is asking them to do, uh, and to, to clarify the areas that might be left a little bit um, unclear from a simple reading of the law. Now, these reporting financial institutions are going to have to develop IT systems. 
to apply the due diligence checks and to submit the return to you that they're obliged to submit. That means they're going to have to be working on their IT systems. And the first thing they're going to want to know is what does your system look like? You're asking us to make an electronic return of information to you. I'm going to have to build a system to do that. What does your system look like so I can build it so it will work? And what we found in the UK is we were, we were pretty confident because we developed uh, an awful lot of detailed guidance. But when someone is writing an IT system, the level of detail that you go down to can be very granular, very distinct. And I'll give you an example. Um, Evis mentioned CRS 2.0. So, so the original reporting standard has been tweaked a little bit last year, and we're having to make some changes to it. Now, one of those changes is you have to report whether or not an account is a joint account. Under the old system, you would just report there's this account, and at the end of the year, it had two million pounds in it. And the account holder was John Swerdlow. But if it was a joint account, you would also say, and the account holder was Femi Edgel. And you would have to report that fact to both Nigeria and, the, uh, and, and, and where, where, uh, if I was living in uh, Mauritius, Mauritius. So the tax authorities in Mauritius would be thinking, oh, we have, we have two million pounds held by John Swerdlow, and the tax authorities in Nigeria would think two million by Femi. So that's been cleared up. Um, now you have to report whether or not you're dealing with a joint account. It seems simple enough. A small change to the guidance. Just tell people, OK, now you have to report joint accounts. Now industry starts coming to us and saying, we're writing our IT system now. So the IT system has to gather the data. It has to put it in a certain format. What happens if it's not a joint account at the start of the year, but then someone else joins it halfway through, and then towards the end, someone else joins it? And then maybe next year, a couple of people leave. What does our system have to report? And you can look at the law, and you can look at the guidance, and you wouldn't really know the answer. You can, you can extrapolate the answer because the CRS tells you you're reporting the account at the end of the calendar year. So logic would tell you, OK, then you'd simply look how many joint account holders are there at the end of the calendar year. And that's what you report. But if you're the compliance officer of a bank paying an IT consultant a large amount of money to create an IT system which is going to do that, you don't want to extrapolate or deduce things, or you want a clear cut expression of exactly what is going to be from the regulatory authority. So that's the first thing to be ready for. There will be lots of questions from the reporting financial institutions about the IT system, and they can be very detailed questions. And this will be coming at the same time that you're trying to get your own system sorted out, you're trying to get your own laws in place, you're trying to get your own unit ready. But you can't neglect that, because in the real world, the people who are doing the reporting to you absolutely have to be brought along. On the same subject, again, it was something I think Chris touched on this morning to do with uh, global minimal taxes. They're having to look at their own IT systems to work out whether they can gather the information and so on that you're after. Now, financial institutions are certainly in the UK, but I think more globally, very conservative when it comes to making changes to their IT systems. If you think if they get it wrong, it means people can't pay their mortgage, they can't buy food. In the worst case scenario, they lose their money. So they're understandably, for strong commercial reasons, generally slow and reluctant to make big changes to IT systems. And it's even worse than that. If you think about most of the larger financial institutions, they've grown organically over time. There have been mergers and acquisitions that have built them up to their current size. And with each merger and acquisition, they've probably inherited legacy IT systems. Maybe even their current IT people don't fully understand some of the smaller legacy IT systems. So again, there's a need to be patient with them whilst they're trying to come up to speed and develop the IT systems that, you will, um, that will be needed. Now, the good news is that some of this experience is coming from back in 2015 and 16 when the UK started. And automatic exchange was kind of being invented as it went along. The standard was developing. Today, it's a very different landscape. You can buy an IT system to handle the common reporting standard from a third-party contractor off the shelf. 
Multinationals already understand how this works in lots of different jurisdictions. So the worst of the problems you probably won't encounter, but nevertheless, some of them will, will, will still be there. Um, before I move on from technological issues, I'll give you an example of something the UK did that I would recommend you do not do. Um, I would say probably the reason we have the common reporting system is because the Americans introduced FATCA, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. And we were all struggling to comply with the Americans' FATCA without any benefit for ourselves, other than the fact that our industries wouldn't be hindered by very large withholding taxes. So we decided we should have our own version of FATCA that involves us exchanging information with each other. That's where the CRS came from. Now, in the UK, we thought we would be clever, and we thought we will have a schema that covers both the CRS and FATCA. So if you're a business, all you have to do is fill in one schema, and then HMRC will split the information. This goes to America. This goes to the CRS system. I wouldn't recommend that you do that. <laughs> it hasn't been particularly appreciated. People prefer to have, that's the IRS schema. That's the CRS schema. We know where we are. Uh, and as we're finding now with CRS 2.0, when you have to make changes to one of the schemas, if you have a hybrid schema, you have to make, you know, you're, you're making bigger changes to affect more systems. So what I'm saying is, I would do what I think most people do. Have a common portal, which is useful for your customers who are having to supply returns, so they can use the same portal, maybe, to make their FATCA returns if you decide to, to have a joint system and CRS returns but keep the, keep the schema and the IT separate. Okay, moving on now to compliance challenges. This is from the point of view, you heard if you say one of the things the Global Forum do when you sign up to a standard and implement it is they come and check that you're doing it properly. And one, one little detail is that when the Global Forum come and check, they come with your peers. They come with other jurisdictions who are doing the common reporting standard. Now, those are the jurisdictions. Very often, a large part of their economy depends upon financial services. So if you're dealing with those assessors, they can be even more strict than Evis. Yeah, the standard is the standard, and everyone has to obey and apply the same standard. And one of the parts of the standard is that you must be making sure that the financial institutions in your jurisdiction are providing you with the information they should be providing you with, and in return, you're going to receive that back from everyone else. That means you have to have a compliance framework for checking that your reporting financial institutions are doing what they should be doing. Now, one of the problems we had in the UK is that the common reporting standard has a definition for financial institution that is quite wide. If you think about the whole point of this is to catch tax cheats. They're not just going to walk into a high street bank and say, oh, can I hide my money here, please? There's all kinds of financial assets that can be used to hide illicit wealth. And so the common reporting standard has a very broad definition of what a financial institution is. In one particular kind of institution, I won't go into too much detail, um, but for example, it catches family trusts. In the UK, some of the wealthier families have a trust to manage their wealth through the generations. Now, under the common reporting standard, that is caught as a financial institution, and it's a reporting financial institution. From the trust's point of view, it's a family trust. They don't have customers. They don't have uh, shops on the high street where customers can come in and open accounts and carry out transactions. They don't think of themselves at all as a financial institution. So when we were running all of our publicity and explaining there's a new law coming in, it didn't really land with them. You know, we could put adverts in newspapers, we could have reports on the radio stations and so on. We could engage with, um, with all kinds of people, but it wouldn't reach these people because they weren't listening, because they didn't think of themselves as a financial institution. Why would I care about something that affects financial institutions? Even worse, they're not part of the, uh, the bodies, that, the industry bodies that we would use as our route to communicate and publicize things. So, for example, it's easy to reach the banks because there's the British Banking Association. We could do joint events like this with the Banking Association and be looking out at a sea of bank managers. But these financial institutions, for example, the family trusts, 
They're not members of that. We have a trust practitioner society, but these people weren't necessarily professional trust practitioners. So they were doubly difficult to reach. And then the final nail in this coffin was that not only did they not think of themselves as financial institutions, but the broader UK regulatory financial service bodies didn't think of them as financial institutions either because they didn't have customers. The public didn't need to be protected from malpractice because these guys did not have public customers. So the Financial Conduct Authority did not have these people on their list of practitioners. So what that meant is um, a, a good approach to uh, the compliance oversight of reporting financial institutions is to look at lists. Look at the FATCA list. If you've got someone reporting to the IRS under FATCA, they should probably be reporting to you under the CRS. If you've got someone who's subject to your banking regulatory authority, there's a pretty good chance they're going to have some foreign customers who should and therefore should be reporting to you under the CRS. So you can clash your lists and identify people that might need to be audited to check that they understand the CRS and they're doing it properly. You can't do that with this particular kind of customer that I've been talking about. And in the UK, that was a big problem for us. What was our solution? We've decided to set up a register. So all of these people are going to have to register. That will give us a list of, um, of um, people who are within the definition of a CRS financial institution that we can check against and see who's making returns. Now, some jurisdictions have gone even further than that. They introduced a nil return requirement. So if you're a reporting financial institution within the definition of the CRS and you don't have anyone to report, because in my example, you're a small family trust and you just don't have anyone to report, you would have to make a nil return. And then when I'm sat in my HQ and I'm deciding an audit process, I can look at who's been making a lot of nil returns and maybe pick them out. In the UK, we didn't go for that. We just decided we wanted a register um, because we have thousands and thousands of reporting financial institutions as it is, and we didn't want to, to muddy our data with nil returns. But for others, a nil return might be even better than simply having a register. Because I don't want to go on for too long, I'll just mention one other compliance issue, and this is from the point of view of the reporting financial institution. This is a very typical issue. It will probably be one that would occur in your jurisdiction. So the CRS requires a reporting financial institution to report the tax identification number of the account holder, of the customer that they're reporting on. And that's fine for new accounts. Because if I'm a, let, let's narrow it down and say I'm a bank officer, someone walks in and wants to open an account with me, I know what I need to do for the know your client onboarding procedures, I probably have to look at something like the passport for anti-money laundering, and as part of that process now, I have to get a tax identification number from him too. Pretty simple. Where it gets harder is when you're looking at old accounts, what, what the CRS calls pre-existing accounts. Because if you go back a few years before you introduce this law, why would I as a bank manager care at all about a tax reference for a foreign customer in another country? I just wouldn't have that on my account. What the CRS says you have to do is you have to make reasonable efforts to obtain the TIN in those circumstances. And what that usually means is if I'm a bank officer, I will write a couple of letters to my, to my customer asking him to, to, what's your TIN, please? Now, what do you do if your customer ignores you? The CRS has an answer in the situation where you, you're required to get a self-certification, um, and jurisdictions might have penalties in place ranging from financial to criminal for someone who makes a false certification or for someone who refuses to make a, cer a, cer a certification. But this is in that gray area. It doesn't require a certification. It just says reasonable efforts. And if the customer is refusing to respond, then you have an issue. The good news is, although this was a big issue for the, for the UK and quite a few other jurisdictions, that's been picked up in CRS2. And what CRS2 now says is if you're doing any kind of interaction with your customer for anti-money laundering purposes, then you must obtain a TIN. And that gives the bank, for example, good grounds to be more forceful with the customer and maybe to impose sanctions or measures if the customer won't respond. Plus, of course, you still have 
a circumstance where a self-certification is required. Maybe he wants to change his address where you can still obtain the tin. Okay, finally, use of data. So, um, I mean, Femi was really enthusiastic about the data that came in, and you saw some of the slides that Yves put up about um, the kind of yields that you can get from this. In the UK, we receive literally millions of data um, account reports under the CRS every year. And um, you, you heard Evis mention that the UK has worked with some of the jurisdictions. So I can say a couple of the jurisdictions we've worked with, they are receiving hundreds of thousands of account details every year. Now, if you turn around to your auditors, or 50 or 100 of them, and you tell them, okay, we're receiving 200,000 accounts this year. What do you think they're going to do? If you say, right, go get them. They're going to say, well, I'll be back next century, shall I? <laughs> There's only so much hands-on investigation that even the largest of audit units can carry out. So you need some other approach. Now, um, Evis, I think, mentioned a voluntary disclosure program. And that is some, that, 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 that's, a, um, that's a very good answer, because the idea here is not that you're going around to each individual item of data that you've received. What you're doing is you're using the publicity from that to drive people to take up an, an offer to voluntarily come forward and make an admission about what their tax returns really should have been showing. Now, the issue with that is, is it's, a, it's a carrot to encourage the donkey to move. But lots of people, especially Nigerians, I think, Femi, <laughs> they're quite uh, brave, they're quite entrepreneurial, and they're not going to be tempted just by a carrot. You also need a big plank of wood to smack the donkey on the back. And that's what the CRS gives you. Because the CRS, you can publicize, I'm going to find out, if you have a bank account in London, if you have a bank account in Geneva, we're going to know about it. By the way, there's this voluntary disclosure opportunity you might be a bit more interested in now you're worried about getting caught. Even, even better than that, very often, the account manager, the reporting financial institution in London, in Switzerland, will be writing to their customer to say, your country has just introduced something called the common reporting standard. Under the law in London, I now have to provide all of your banking account details every year to the tax authority in your jurisdiction. So that really makes him pay attention at breakfast time when he's hearing about a voluntary disclosure scheme on the radio and he's reading a letter from his bank manager saying, I'm about to tell that tax authority all about your offshore wealth. So that can be a very effective way of leveraging the CRS data without having to have a massive audit function to effectively use it all. In the UK, we were in a slightly different position because we'd obtained data before the CRS via various banking leaks, and we'd introduced previous voluntary disclosure programs. So the approach in the UK for the CRS data is something called the Worldwide Disclosure Facility. We don't have a voluntary disclosure program as a one-off event. We have, every year, an opportunity to use the Worldwide Disclosure Facility. That's our carrot. And our stick is that we have something called the No Safe Haven Strategy, um, which is an overall approach for how you tackle offshore evasion. So, for example, if I go home and I hide my money under the mattress in the UK and I get caught, the penalty is X, X pounds. But if I hide my money in an offshore jurisdiction, everything else is exactly the same, the same amount, the same activity, it's just I've hidden it offshore, under the no safe haven strategy, the penalty is 2x, and you can expect to read about it in the newspaper. So you can see the CRS can form a part of a wider strategy to tackle offshore invasion that includes a carrot, like a voluntary disclosure facility, that has real teeth because they know you're going to find out about them through the CRS. Okay, and finally, because um, I'm, I'm conscious of time, Jeff, so finally, um, Again, something that Dan mentioned uh, earlier on, I, I don't know if you, you noticed, he said one to many, which is just a fancy way of saying that we use things like radio adverts, newspaper adverts, and, and even letters that we send out to, to, to mailing lists. We've used that in connection with the common reporting standard information. Now, um, I've told, I can only say a certain amount about this because we're using randomized data samples because we're looking at behavioral science. 
And apparently, if you tell the people whose behavior you're trying to study too much about what you're doing, their behavior changes and the whole study isn't worth anything. So I can say a little bit about it. I can't say too much, and we're still evaluating the results. So I, unfortunately, I can't even tell you how good it's been, um, other than to say it has been effective. So one of the, the, the nudges that we've done is that we've sent some of the people that we have CRS information on letters saying, hey, we've got this information about you. So it's not just that bank manager maybe who's written them a letter saying, I'm going to have to tell HMRC about this. They've actually had a letter from the tax authority saying, we know you've got this account in Abuja with this much money in it. You'd better sort yourself out. So we've done that for a sample. For another sample, in the UK, tax returns are digital. They're filed online. And they don't typically include pages about offshore income. That would be like an extra module that you would request onto your computer when you're filing your tax return. Well, one year, what we did is put the check in the box for them. So they would go to log into their online tax return, and they would be surprised to see that when it came up, it had the online pages attached as well. The next year, we tried a slightly gentler approach, and this time, instead of actually the pages coming up, we would simply have a pop-up message saying, I see you're filing your tax return. From what we know about you, you probably want to be using the offshore pages, and we would leave it for them to take it. And what we're moving to now is an even gentler approach. We're going to move towards more of an idea about, you might benefit from understanding what the UK's tax rules say about wealth that you have in an offshore jurisdiction. Um, how do you declare it to us, and what release are available against it? So, um, I just give that as an example, that a compliance approach linked to the CRS information doesn't have to simply be, there you go, order to go away and use it. That should definitely be part of your approach, especially linked to risk profiling, but it shouldn't be the entirety of the approach, because you do not have enough auditors to use all the information you will get if you implement the CRS. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, John. That was a lot of information and learning for all of us. In the interest of time, I'll quickly call upon Mr. Jaspreet from the IRAS of Singapore to hear from their experience as well. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Gautam, and thank you, Femi and John also for the sharing on UK. Uh, so I'll briefly run through what Singapore has done in terms of CRS reporting. So Singapore implemented CRS for AEOI from in 2018, and I'll, I'll briefly touch on some challenges we have faced uh, on the compliance front and also in terms of technological um, challenges. So when AEOI first came about, it was a new standard for IRAS, which is uh, Inland Revenue Authority of Singapore. And it required us to have a good understanding of the financial industry in Singapore. So we, we worked very closely with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, or MAS, which regulates financial institutions. Uh, and this helped us to leverage on open channels of communication that they had with financial institutions. Um, so we, we discussed CRS-related matters, such as industry developments, sector-specific regulatory risks, and best practices in regulatory compliance reviews. And during the drafting of our own domestic uh, CRS legislation, uh, MAS was consulted on the different types of licenses that were to be issued to the FIs in Singapore. And MAS also was asked on sector-specific regulatory risks, which then informed our own risk-based identification so that when we are coming up with the audit targets, we have something to, to make reference to. So these engagements were, were very useful and contributed to more effective design of, of measures to implement the CRS standards. Another challenge was that uh, for Singapore FIs, um, they, they needed to understand their CRS obligations and voluntarily comply. We wanted them to comply without us requiring to extensively intervene in the process. So, so we have this Integrated Compliance and Service Framework, ICSF. Uh, it's an overarching framework that guides us in formulating strategies and initiatives that will cohesively support our corporate goals um, to provide excellent service and maximize voluntary compliance. 
So using these, the four strategic elements in, in this ICSF, um, we, we were able to galvanize our AEOI compliance and service efforts to promote and maximize voluntary compliance, um, which, which contributes to the fulfillment of CRS requirements. So for instance, there is this strategic element called right design from the start. So we want FIs to be able to comply uh, from the start, like from, from the first time they have to submit the information to us. So from 2019, when we established a common language between us and FIs to facilitate the compliance activities, uh, the measures introduced under the ICSF collectively enable IRAs to keep the CRS service context manageable and achieve more than 90% of FIs filing their CRS returns on time. And also, um, we also embarked on various compliance programs to target key areas, key risk areas based on our risk register. Um, so we also, we also do a lot of engagement with the FIs. So we, we take a collaborative approach with the FIs and our exchange partners in, re in respect of CRS compliance. And we employ various upstream and downstream strategies so educational engagements, compliance reviews. Through our interactions with the FIs, we establish strong feedback channels to better understand the challenges that they face in complying. And to help them get it right from the start, we conduct workshops, seminars um, from for FIs from different industries so that they are aware of, of the requirements that they have. Um, we also have an onboarding guide to which comprises different essential information and we send it to the newly registered FIs upon their registration with IRAS. Um, okay, so some other things that we do, uh, we, have, we have very comprehensive guidelines to outline the expected internal controls FIs should implement. So we have 23 hallmarks or desired outcomes that FIs should achieve to demonstrate the robustness of their operating environment. Uh, there's also various self-review toolkits to, to support them in fulfilling their CRS obligations. Uh, we continually enhance our communication with FIs to ensure relevance and effectiveness. So whenever an FI raises an issue to us that is deemed that is potentially relevant to other financial institutions, we will actually update our CRS web page and associated guides accordingly. Uh, this approach creates a feedback loop and allows us to empower FIs with improved self-help capabilities. Uh, so while we, we strive to support the financial institutions, we also maintain a balanced enforcement approach. We determine appropriate sanctions for CRS non-compliance by considering various factors, such as the nature of the offense, seriousness of the error, and efforts undertaken by the financial institution to comply with their obligations. And we issue them warning letters when incorrect reporting is due to genuine errors, and they are cooperative in remediating their mistakes but we do not hesitate to impose penalties for repeat non-compliance or serious errors by first-time offenders. So just to touch very briefly on the technological, the technological challenges that um, we face and also the FIs face. So I think which, whatever jurisdiction seeks to implement CRS, you will need to have a system in place to sort, prepare, validate, and transmit the AEOI data in accordance with the prevailing CRS XML schema and the requirements under the CRS XML schema user guide. Um, so this requires the system to be able to process data in XML format and package or decrypt the package files from uh, the common transmission system in accordance with the CTS file preparation guide. Um, so some measures to ensure the effective management and security of the vast amounts of data that we receive. We conduct regular data security risk assessments to ensure that uh, we are aware of the data security risks and we are able to manage them in a timely and effective manner. Uh, we also identify and implement the appropriate technical and process measures to mitigate data safe security risks and uh, based on our assessment of the data security risks. Yep, uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Singapore, uh, for sharing some of the areas we needed to focus on in preparing for the implementation of the CRS uh, standard in Singapore. Uh, that's a critical aspect of the automatic UI system because it's an exchange. Your financial officials in your country must identify your portable accounts and exchange them with your treaty partners in a confidential and safe manner. 
and your financial institutions need to be prepared for it. Um, that's why the quality of data that is shared across the world, uh, Evans gave us statistics in 2022 that 123 million uh, financial accounts were exchanged between over 100 countries with uh, balances in those financial accounts of over $4 trillion. Uh, it means that there was some qualitative process of generating those data so that it can be shared. So you need to prepare both what you're taking for financial institutions so that you can also receive quality from uh, your treaty uh, partners. On that note, I see that uh, we were set to go for tea, uh, which um, we, we're told we should return back to a plenary at, at four. We had had the experiences from Nigeria, uh, lessons from the United Kingdom, who are some of the first movers, uh, and now Singapore. Uh, just to nudge our Qatar members, those who are contemplating adopting the CRS standard, to those who are using it as advanced jurisdictions, whatever, uh, wherever you are in that range, end to end, what are their comments or questions from any of our members before we take a break? Uh, Elvis is here, the, the, from the OECD Global Forum that coordinates the automatic UI system, and there are other colleagues here. Any questions or comments? Okay, I can see, yes. Okay, so over there, first, please, you have the floor. Then you next. Okay, there's a microphone. Oh, then they can, technical can give me a microphone if it's in working. It's working now. Okay, all right. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah, my, my name is Ahmad Zafir from Malaysia. Uh, I'm from the International Affairs. Uh, um, basically, the not so to speak question, but just to give a bit of what we went through, uh, we just finished our CRS effectiveness review uh, two weeks ago. And then last year, we had our CDS review. So it was, it was, a, it was a very challenging time, and, but we got through it. <laughs> uh, as you all know, once you go through the review, it, it will dawn on to you that there are things that you need to look at. Uh, but thankfully, we, we got through it. Um, just to give light to what uh, effectiveness that got through from uh, Malaysia's endeavor through EOI and AEOI, um, we managed to get settlement at a, of about 350 million uh, through 5,000 total cases from 2018 up until 2021. So that was our uh, adventure through the implementation of AEOI. So just as a, uh, as a um, note to everyone, once, once you are called for a review, please prepare and, uh, and get help or experiences from other colleagues who went through it. Um, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, you make a compelling case for those who we need to join $50 million national taxes that wouldn't have been there if you didn't do automatic UI. And truly, that visit will come maybe one or two years after you begin to implement the UI system. The Global Forum will come and check whether how effective it has been. And uh, once again, just to reiterate that the Qatar membership, because of the diversity of it, from the least developed authorities to the very advanced are in the Qatar. And so we can leverage from those experiences that we have here to help one another. Uh, I see my colleague over there, yes. Hello. 
Thank you so much. You need to put up the other one. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Michael, the head of large taxpayers in, in Tanzania Revenue Authority. Um, we have made a step at last after a cumbersome process. We did a peer review uh, round one and we are booked for round two uh, next year. And also uh, on the mark, we have sent our our final document to OECD headquarters, and they have brought us uh, some, some issues to clarify that we are working on it, on confidentiality and all that. So we are on the track. Uh, hopefully, uh, by the end of the next year, we'll be together with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to hear that. And once again, they are across the table. Countries will have done well there. They'll be able to support you with Qatar. I think on that note, I must call on Gutam, the chair of the working group, except I say on the hand, to round up for us. A round of applause for all of us. Thank you so much. With that, uh, thank you Femi and thanks uh, Avis and all of you. With this, I think we can break for lunch and uh, for tea. My bad, for tea. Let's see you after that. Thanks a lot.